And if I was uh, a Chinese strategist and I wanted to, to, let's say, dethrone the dollar, which is their stated objective, the easiest way is to drive the gold price a lot higher. You've got here a trend which shows an increase in preference to hold gold among these, uh, these let's say, uh, uh, I'm not gonna say enemy central banks, but you get the idea. So this basically means gold must go a lot higher and substantially higher. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, a channel where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the Ed JR Mining Guy over on X, and of course, your host of this channel. And I'm really, really looking forward to this discussion. I was so excited when it popped up in my calendar because it's with Michael Howell. He's the king of liquidity. He's the liquidity king, and uh, some call him on uh, on YouTube to call him the goat. But uh, I'm really excited to have him on. Like we've seen so many macro events happen that could impact global liquidity flows, and I'm really curious how that will impact and shape the financial markets and the global economy is moving forward. We had the Fed rate cut. Of course, that's been four weeks now since we've seen that, but I haven't had a chance to catch up with Michael. So I'm really curious from a liquidity perspective, how is that impacting the financial markets? And of course, China stimulus. I keep reading articles that China is not stimulating enough. And then I read an article that uh, GDP growth was higher in China than everybody expected. So we'll see if, we, if any of that makes sense and uh, trying to make sense of it. Now, without much further ado, and uh, while you hit that subscribe button, I'll switch over to my guest, Michael Howell. Michael, it is great to have you back on the program. I'm really and genuinely excited about this conversation. Great guy. Very good to be here. Much looking forward to it. Yeah, same same here. Let, let, let's dive right in. As I said, we have a lot to digest and a lot to chew through and, uh, of course, lots of predictions to make here. But uh, maybe we'll start at the top. And uh, since we last spoke in about uh, end of April, roughly, I think April 20th or so, we chatted last. Um, how has the global economy changed? And what's the, what's the state of the global economy in the financial markets right now, Michael? Well, I think what you've got to do is, first of all, uh, distinguish between two things. Um, one of the mantras we often think of is to say that strong economies don't always have strong financial markets, and uh, weak economies very often do have strong financial markets. In actual fact, the best time for risk assets is when economies are sluggish and policymakers are trying to goose those economies by stimulating uh, either in the form of more fiscal spending or more particularly in terms of adding liquidity to markets. And that's pretty much what's going on now. The world economy is not recessionary. That's, a, you know, tick that box. That's positive. Uh, but it's certainly not growing fast. Uh, inflation is, uh, you know, is, is coming down, as we know. But central banks everywhere want to ease. And it's not just the fact they're cutting interest rates. They're actually telling us now, they're standing up and saying, that we're going to cut next meeting. Uh, you know, Jay Powell said, you know, expect a 25 basis point cut of the coming, of the coming FOMC. The governor of the Bank of England said, you know, uh, we're going to cut next meeting. We're, we've been told that these these uh, these monetary policy committees were were data dependent and they were co democratic committees. So you know, central bank leaders standing up and saying rate cuts are coming is actually quite a quite a significant point. Uh, and the worry has got to be is that they're kind of easing aggressively into a melt up in markets. But you know, broadly for the near term, let's enjoy it. Uh, you know, as we keep saying, we've been bullish since uh, you know October of 2022, there's been an upswing in the liquidity cycle through that period. Liquidity drives markets, but more particularly, if you've got a situation where the US economy is sluggish, where the Federal Reserve is desperate to ease by all accounts, and you've got China, which is suffering deflation, in other words, capping global inflation, what's not to like? In the near term, it looks pretty good. The problem is, once you get into 2025, there are challenges. And we'll talk about those challenges, Michael. And uh, not sure where to start because, again, so many topics to chew through. But one of the last things I wrote down is that the Fed is desperate. And uh, the Fed is desperate to ease rates. And I have retweeted you actually the other day when you said, well, they're not data dependent anymore because I think it was a Financial Times article that you posted on your on your ex, um, on your ex feed about, uh, yes, we're, we are cutting rates. And exactly as you said, like, they're not data dependent anymore. They don't care. We're going to do it anyway. Right. But we got to talk about the motivation and what 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 has led to those statements, which are definitely not uh, what we're used to over the last two years. So what do you think of the motivation here is, Michael? Well, I think the thing is, is that at the end of the day, what really matters to policymakers is the integrity of their bond markets. OK, we could, you know, dance on the head of a pin and say, you know, is it inflation? Is it an employment mandate? I mean, that's what their public face is. But the reality is is when their sovereign debt markets become challenged, 
uh, policy makers act because that's what they've got to do is to finance government. And you can see evidence uh, in the case of the British guilt debacle uh, in September of 2022 when the incoming, uh, the new prime minister, the incoming prime minister Truss basically delivered a budget statement which the markets hated and the British guilt market, the sovereign debt market in the UK, sold off aggressively. Now, the Bank of England turned in an instant from quantitative tightening to quantitative easing. So there is your example of what happens when you get a sovereign debt market under pressure. And I would say that if you look at the US, this is another thing that we've got to start thinking about seriously, because there's a whole raft of measures that are going through in the US that we call, uh, you know, somewhat flippantly, uh, not QE, QE, and not yield curve control, yield curve control, that are distorting the market significantly. And let me give you some evidence of that. If you look at what the Federal Reserve has been doing, and I can demonstrate that with some charts in a moment, but if you look at what the Federal Reserve has been doing, basically the Federal Reserve has been injecting liquidity into markets, even though it's been, the public face has been saying, we aren't undertaking QT, we are cutting back on our liquidity injections. Now, let me point you to a chart uh, because I sent some charts over, but it's basically um, uh, quite a lot further down. Uh, maybe I can do this uh, because I know where it is. So let me <laughs> let me whisk through uh, these as quickly as I can. Um, so, sorry, let me, I've, I've gone too far, so just bear with me. So, oh, no worries. Um, there. Right. So if you look at this chart, what this shows you is the Fed balance sheet, which is the red line, uh, you can see in the big chart, which is basically peaking, uh, and then it looks like a hump and it starts to go down. That is the Federal Reserve undertaking QT publicly. That's the headline figure. But the orange line that is drawn behind that represents the liquidity injections that the Federal Reserve puts into the system. So in other words, it's balance sheet operations and not entirely liquidity creating. Some elements destroy liquidity, some create liquidity. So you've got to look at the orange line to say, what is the truth here? What's the true number of injections, true amount of injections? And you'll see that there's an inflection uh, in that orange line, which occurs in late 2022. That was the British guilt crisis. That was a wake up call for policymakers worldwide to say that we can't keep squeezing uh, these markets because you're going to get disruption in our sovereign debt markets. And then you see the SVB, the Silicon Valley Bank failure. Uh, in March of 2023, and that's another instance where you see this step up in liquidity. And broadly, over the last uh, two years, what you've seen is a gradual trajectory towards rising liquidity in the US market. So this is a key factor that we've got to start understanding that this is really the reality. Now, the next slide is maybe a little bit wonkish, but it maybe shows exactly as well what's going on. And this is what we describe as uh, as I say, uh, not QE, QE, uh, not quantitative easing, but it really is quantitative easing. And this is showing bank reserves in the US system. This is the key thing for understanding liquidity in American money markets. And at the end of the day, that's a sort of the beating heart of the system. The orange line is overall bank reserves. And this red line that we've drawn just below is a one standard deviation uh, drop below that to indicate the stress that is occurring in the regional banks, the small banks that maybe have less ability to garner reserves. And that's where you get this threshold that we've drawn, which is the threshold for adequate reserves. Anywhere below that creates tension in money markets, in our view. So that's the that's the line you dare not cross. And what's happened is that Fed liquidity was sluggish, sufficiently sluggish to push this red line down below. And what have they done? They've changed the rules here, which is why we've got this step down in August, where they changed the rules on bank stress tests, where they now said from uh, going forward, banks can now use borrowings at the discount window at the Fed, um, ability to use the standing repo facility and any borrowings from the federal home loan banks, which is a government sponsored enterprise in their stress tests. So it immediately releases, we think, about $800 billion dollars. Uh, back into money markets that the banks don't need uh, to satisfy their stress tests. They can actually, you know, they can, in other words, buy treasuries and then repo those treasuries at the discount window or the standing repo facility whenever needed. So it's given them a lot more flexibility. So what these things are basically saying is that what you've got, and I'm going to 
finish on this slide that I'm going to show you in a second. What you've got is the global liquidity cycle, which is the, you know, the main driver of asset markets and economies worldwide, the flow of money through world financial markets inflected in October of 2022, as you can see here, and it's rising and it's slated to peak in late 2025. And that red dotted line that we put on there is a sine wave. And just to rest assured, we're not cheating too much here. We actually estimated that sine wave back in year 2000. So it's been running um, for 25 years pretty much now, uh, you know, as it was estimated on past data and the frequency and the match seems to be you know, pretty good. So it's not exact, but it gives you a, a, a context as to how markets and liquidity is basically playing out. Okay. A couple of follow-ups to that, Michael, and maybe in, in, in layman's terms and explain it to me like I'm five years old, but where, where does the liquidity show up now? You said the bank balance sheet, um, they invest in bonds. Um, the, the, it goes back to the Fed, uh, the U.S. Treasury, but like maybe explain it very, in very simple terms so I and my viewers can understand it, but where does that liquidity show up? How is it helping and, and maybe supporting the economy in the U.S. right now? Well, I think the thing to say is that, you know, you've got to think of liquidity as a pipeline, and that pipeline pretty much begins with the central banks. Um, it then feeds through the financial system and the financial system becomes more liquid. Banks start to create credit, uh, collateral values rise. Those collateral values, such as rising bond prices or rising asset values themselves facilitate more liquidity because you can borrow against collateral, which is a very important point to understand in the modern world. Uh, and that starts to inflate liquidity in the, across financial markets broadly. And then that spills out. It spills out into asset markets. Uh, you tend to find that uh, in the very early stages, the fixed income markets, uh, the credit markets, and the Forex markets are most sensitive to, uh, to rising liquidity. Then it feeds through into equities. It starts to then hit the real economy. Commodity markets start to rise. And you get this general transmission uh, of liquidity through the economy. And then ultimately, maybe we're talking about two years to three years later, it may start to appear in faster high street inflation, uh, which is clearly a negative that that will then cause central banks ultimately to come back and tighten. So that's really the process that we think of. And in fact, there's a slide uh, which I can show you, which I'll put up, which gives you an idea of the sensitivity of different asset classes to a 10% global liquidity shock. So what that's really saying is that you you get these multiplier effects, which is shown on the left hand axis. So if you're looking at gold, which I know is a big focus of you and your uh, your listeners, if you look at gold, what that's saying is that for every, uh, let's say, 10 percent increase in global liquidity, you're looking at something like a 15 to 20 percent uh, increase in uh, the value of gold. Uh, silver tends to be more leveraged. But then if you start to look at the cryptocurrencies, what you'll see there are some very, very big responses of cryptocurrencies. I mean, you get the response that you, know, you can get four or five to one in terms of uh, the leverage on those in terms of response to liquidity. Now, it's important to distinguish in that chart the red bar from the, uh, from the orange bar. The red bar is data you, over a whole period. So we've looked here going back to about 2012, I believe it was, uh, which is using weekly data and using rec uh, regression analysis to basically show the sensitivity of these different asset classes. Mm -hmm. The orange bar is the last 18 months. And what you've got with cryptocurrency is obviously part of it's a learning effect. So those responses in the early days were highly, highly sensitive. And now they're coming down to more normal levels. So don't expect looking forward the same degree of sensitivity, whereas gold and silver, which are much longer established asset classes, seem to have very stable responses. And, you know, one of the things that, that we keep saying, mm. maybe it's becoming more and more obvious to everyone now, is that, look, the reason that gold is at an all time high here is that there's lots of liquidity, monetary liquidity in the system. And that is driving these asset prices higher. Silver will ultimately catch up. It always does. But it's, uh, you know, as they as they label it sort of flippantly, it's the restless metal. Uh, it tends to, uh, you know, have periods of uh, strong outperformance and then uh, dullness for a long time. Yeah. Now, since, since you have that slide up, I do have to ask, because you, you almost answered that question, but Bitcoin, Ethereum, like, how confident are you in that in that data? It's, as you said, like, it's a very short time period that you have a track record of, like the, 
the um, the association of gold. Oh, sorry, of, of Bitcoin and uh, liquidity, global liquidity. Like, how, how confident are you in that data? And uh, I don't know, maybe a bit of cheeky here, but isn't it too early to make those assumptions? I'm curious. Yes, I, I think that's I, right. I, I mean, I, 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 the answer is not not so confident. I mean, one would have to yeah. say that in in all truth, because it's a comparatively small sample. But you know, what I, I'm not an expert on Bitcoin nor on crypto generally. But the point that we've made to our clients is, look, you know, what you see is what you get. You've got to accept the fact that uh, these securities are behaving uh, like monetary inflation hedges. That's what we've seen for the last 10 years. Will they continue to do that? I, I don't know. Uh, will gold continue to do that? Yes, it will, because gold has got, uh, you know, two or three thousand years of uh, long term history of basically protecting investors against monetary inflation. And in fact, if you if I go on to I think it's the next slide, it basically illustrates that process. And what we've got here, just for the record, is to show in orange there, this is the market value of, of gold uh, in the world. So you think of that broadly as the gold as the gold bullion price, but it's measured in terms of the of the size of the uh, of the pool of gold. And the black line is global liquidity. So that is a measure of monetary inflation in the system. And what you can see is that the gold market is pretty much keeping pace with that. Now, it doesn't step, you know, it doesn't go step for step, but over the, the trend is clearly there, as you can see from that, from the evidence in the chart. The dotted line that we show there, the black dotted line, for reference is American consumer price inflation. And the point about the chart and the reason for drawing it is that we keep saying and trying to hammer home that gold is not a high street inflation hedge probably better than that in fact it's a monetary inflation hedge and a high street inflation is a cocktail of monetary inflation elements and cost inflation elements or even cost deflation elements so for example what affects the high street it's all it's partly the federal reserve or uh, the bundesbank or the ecb printing money right but equally it's things like oil prices taxes technological changes uh faster productivity uh, cheap Chinese goods, all these things come into the mix and affect the high street. Now, what you've seen over the last uh, 50 years, as that chart indicates, is that monetary inflation has been way, way faster than high street inflation. And that's really courtesy of the fact that we've had huge technological improvements. Uh, we've had China, um, you know, dumping cheap goods into the West, etc. And that's basically kept the price level capped, even though monetary inflation has been, uh, you know, excessive. Now, you've picked up monetary inflation in rising asset markets, and particularly the gold price. Uh, but, you know, it hasn't really fed through into uh, that monetary stimulus has not fed through into the high street for the reasons that I cited. No. I'm, I'm going to table the gold discussion for a second, because I want to come back to the the initial chart you've shown here of the global liquidity. I'm just going to bring that up real quick, because I really want to understand the drivers of global liquidity right now and uh, really work that out. I, I've hinted at some topics, of course, but I'm curious if there's any other... Um, liquidity shocks, I don't know for lack of a better term, maybe pushing liquidity higher. But uh, I mentioned China stimulus, we discussed the Fed rate cut. Um, what, what else is going to push it higher towards that 100 level at the top of the sinus curve here, Michael? Well, I think the, the main thing that's pushing it higher is central banks uh, adding stimulus. That That's one thing. And the other thing, as I, I alluded to earlier on, is that what you've got within the financial system is uh, a, a sort of pro cyclical mechanisms. Now, in other words, if asset markets go up, that increases the pool of collateral. And collateral is what is used for credit. Credit providers use that as security for future loans. So in other words, this thing feeds, this monster feeds on itself. <laughs> now, this is a world that we are increasingly in. And it's a world that we've relatively recently got in ever since the global financial crisis in 2008. And if you go back to, a, if you like, a pre-2008 uh, world, if you went to uh, borrow from a bank or an institution, uh, they would be lending much more on your future expected income or cash flows than your assets, right? Today, it's almost, it's predominantly not what your prospects are, it's what assets you own. So what that does is it makes the financial system a lot, lot more pro-cyclical. And it probably means from a regulation point of view that banks need to have more capital in their balance sheets to protect against these uncertainties. But that may be a different question. But ultimately, what we're really saying here is that if collateral values rise, so if asset markets rise, 
they're going to rise more mm-hmm. because liquidity is going to be generated on the back of that rising collateral in the first place. So if the central banks start the snowball rolling, this thing can gather pace as it starts to accelerate. And that's basically what we're what we're saying. So you've got to start understanding these collateral forces within the system. Now, there is a chart which I hesitate to put up, but, I, but I will, I'll show because it's, it's <laughs> fairly wonkish, but it, it comes back to the sort of key points for sort of understanding what's going on in markets. Maybe I need to go back here. This is the structure of global liquidity. And I <clears throat> promise not to get caught in the weeds too much in this, but essentially what you've got is a pool of liquidity of 175 trillion. And that is an inverted pyramid that rests on a base, a shadow monetary base that includes the central banks and a pool of collateral. Uh, There's also some cross-border flows in there, but let's look at the collateral. That collateral uh, is multiplied up into global liquidity, and that is the multiplier that you see over time. Now, what drives that multiplier is this, or to a very large extent this, which is the move volatility index. Now, the move index is a measure of volatility across the U.S. government bond term structure, okay? So in other words, it's the volatility of U.S. Treasuries. And the reason for showing this, which is much more important, uh, but equivalent to the VIX index for equities, the ones that everyone likes to look at, but the move is far more important, because basically what it's telling you is how volatile or uncertain is that main collateral pool. So in other words, if U.S. Treasuries start to be highly volatile, the market begins to break down, then there'll be bigger haircuts or cushions that are, that are given by the um, credit providers on the collateral. So in other words, they'll say, look, OK, Kai, you're posting a bond uh, for a thousand euros or a thousand dollars here. But because bond markets are so volatile, I'm only going to lend uh, you nine hundred dollars against that collateral. So I'm going to snip the collateral because I'm very uncertain of the value. So the higher that orange line, the more uncertain the outlook, the lower the effective value of collateral and the less liquidity there is in the system. So this is the other lever that one's got to think of aside from the central banks. Now, what I'm arguing is that the central banks themselves are very keen to get these volatility levels in their treasury markets down, because if you go above that danger line, which we've done a couple of times, that is when they really lose control of their bond markets. And that's when you start to get panic uh, setting in by the policymakers. And what they're trying to do right now is to stem that volatility. Now, um, the Treasury in the US is doing things like Treasury buybacks, but they're also doing things like they're manipulating uh, the auctions. So they're doing a lot more bill finance in America and they're doing a lot more uh, issuance of short dated coupons. And although this is sort of getting a little bit wonkish, uh, for example, Janet Yellen has cut the average tenor of bonds offered at U.S. auctions by about 1.2 years in the last, uh, what, 24 months. So that's quite a big drop in bond speak. So in other words, there's no long dated coupons available. There's lots of short dated ones. What does that do? It distorts the bond market. And, you know, for uh, without, as I say, getting stuck in the weeds here, the implications of this is that the U.S. Treasury yield, we think the main benchmark for global investors the U.S. 10-year yield is about 100 basis points too low because what they're doing is they're squeezing the they're, – they're rationing or creating scarcity in the auctions. They're issuing lots of very short-term bonds, and they're basically starving the big institutions, the pension funds, of these longer-dated coupons. Now, why is that important? It's important for two reasons. Number one is that if the bond yield should be 100 basis points higher than it is, the yield curve in America – would be positively sloped and all these fears of recession would be thrown out of the window, right? The second thing is, is that if you've got the accurate, um, you know, more accurate bond figure, 100 basis points higher, what does it mean for break-even inflation in the US? It means that break-even inflation sure isn't 2%, it's nearer three and a quarter percent. And that makes a meaningful difference when you start to evaluate asset allocation and choose monetary inflation hedges. So these are significant factors that are, that are important. The other thing that you've got to throw into this mix, which is why I'm leading up to a very positive statement about gold and monetary inflation and whatever, is that in this environment, if the, gov- if the government is issuing so much short-dated debt, right, uh, lots of bills, 
lots of two year, three year, five year uh, coupon bonds rather than 20 year or 10 year or whatever. If they're doing that, who buys that stuff? It's the banks. And if the banks buy the bonds, it's monetization. It's purely printing money because bank balance sheets expand and traditional money supply measures expand, uh, you know, para pursuit. And that's what we've got to start, you know, acknowledging that something like three quarters of the expansion in American money supply this year has been debt monetization. <laughs> Milton Friedman, who many people remember, the arch monetarist, uh, sadly no longer with us, he'd be turning in his grave at these, at these things. You know, Stanley Druckermiller, the legendary American investor, in an interview about 12 months ago, when talking about the Federal Reserve and the US Treasury and the numbers they're putting out in this regard, he says, look, these are the numbers we used to expect from Argentina, not from the US Treasury. So I'm not suggesting for a moment that the US is going to enter into hyperinflation, but they're certainly charting a faster inflation path. They're creating monetary inflation, and that is why gold is at an all-time high. And if you look at these statistics, is that in the last 20 years, since year one, well, since year 2000, what's happened is the stock of US debt, US Treasury debt, has increased by eight times. Now, which asset class has gone up eight times in that period? In fact, gold has gone up eight and a half times through that period. So gold has actually matched the increase in US debt. And this fiscal, you know, this fiscal laxness that you're getting that is embedded, not just in America, in Europe, in Britain, uh, you know, right across the world is going to end badly uh, for our financial systems, but it ends very well for gold. Everybody, if you haven't paid close attention, you should rewatch the last 10 minutes or so. Like, Michael, you, you make some excellent, excellent points. I think you just explained the world to us, quite honestly, and how things are working. You've touched on so many points I wanted to follow up with you on. Like, one of them is you're not you're obviously not surprised the 10-year yield is exploding. Stanley Truck, or exploding is a strong word, is going higher, the yield, meaning bonds are going lower. Um but Stanley Druckenmiller, you brought up, he's short bonds, actually. So he's following your thesis to the T. He doesn't like what he's seeing at all. Like he just was on an interview on Bloomberg and uh, sort of repeated that um, as well. You just made sense of everything for me. Like we could probably end the interview right now because you it makes you answered all the questions pretty much in the last 10 minutes, in my opinion. And so if people didn't catch that, I def you should definitely rewatch that because I don't even know how to follow up your your your. Your chat well, just me, now, like, there's some really thing. good points in there, right? Let, let me add one more thing, which if I can put the, uh, yeah. the slide up again. Yeah, I'll bring it up. Uh, I'll, I'll, show, I'll show you something else, which is another point I think it is well worth thinking about in this regard. And that's this chart. Now, if you were China and you wanted to <laughs> derail the dollar, you've got two ways of, of uh, basically doing that. One is that you... Uh, you basically create a rival currency. So you create a, a yuan, which everybody wants to hold, and uh, it becomes the main transaction currency in the world. So that's the one That's one thing you do. That's a tough call because, you know, most trade is still denominated in dollars. China doesn't have the banking network worldwide to create trade credits, etc. It'll be a long, long haul. We're talking, you know, decades and decades and decades for that to happen. The other way you do it is basically you undermine the US dollar as a standard of value. And one of the ways to do that is to basically create uh, a shortage of gold in the system. And what you do is that you let the dollar devalue dramatically against gold by basically pushing up the gold price. Now, this chart is basically showing what I think is a, 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 an interesting and worrying trend, uh, particularly if you don't own gold. And this is the gold holdings of the BRICS, okay, in black, as you can see there, since year 2000, in terms of the uh, how many thousand tons of gold BRIC policymakers own. The red line is U the US gold stock, and the yellow-orange line that you see there is broadening out the BRICS to include the BRICS plus their friends who want to join the BRICS organization. Okay, the standard, it is a Saudi, you know, Kazakhstan, etc. These kind of countries, you know, the Shanghai, uh, the Shanghai core uh, countries, uh, or sorry, Shanghai Corporation countries, plus um, countries like Saudi, uh, UAE, etc. 
So what you can see is as of the end of 2023, the stock of gold holdings among this group exceeded America's gold holdings for the first time ever, right? Now, the more that the dollar goes down against gold and the more that the gold price goes up in value, the more questionable people have, more questions people raise against the dollar. And if I was uh, a Chinese strategist and I wanted to, to, let's say, dethrone the dollar, which is their stated objective, the easiest way is to drive the gold price a lot higher. And that maybe is what they're doing. So what you've got here is a situation where, number one, America is creating monetary inflation. It itself is devaluing the dollar. Secondly, you've got uh, a backdrop here, which is basically saying, look, uh, China and its friends are accumulating gold. So they're doing something here very significant. Um, and what you've got is a rising gold price. And you just extrapolate these trends. Are, is the U.S. going to stop printing money? No, because... The deficit is blowing out. The the uh, the fiscal framework of the U.S. is, and for that matter, Europe is just shot through because of aging demographics and the inability to tax. And then you've got here a trend which shows an increasing preference to hold gold among these uh, these let's say uh, uh, I'm not going to say enemy central banks, but you get the idea. Central banks that are not part of the uh, uh, of, of the Western uh, sphere. So this basically means gold must go a lot higher and substantially higher. So if gold tracks global liquidity, what should we be expecting? If global liquidity, as we suspect, is rising now at a rate of 8 to 10% per annum, which is really simply taken from the growth in government deficits, if that's what's going on, uh, it would double uh, every eight years, right? <laughs> If the stock of liquidity doubles in eight years, why shouldn't the gold price double in eight years? F fantastic, Mike, Michael is like I finally caught my bearing again. Like I've been, you know, fo following and trying to digest here. Since since you brought up gold, might, might as well stay on the gold topic for a second. I'm just going to flip back to a slide you've shown earlier. And it's this one, and uh, you're you're showing the average beta versus the last eighteen months. And a question popped into my head: Do you see actually is, is gold overvalued right now? And and look looking at this. Well, I think that, look, I think the point is that uh, the markets never move in straight lines. I mean, that that's you know, the watchword and all this. And what we're really looking at is the trend. And I think if you look at the next slide where you've got that time series, what that gives you an illustration about um, is, you know, looking at liquidity and looking at gold um, over the, you know, over the long term. Now, if you look at that orange line, OK, as I say, this is the market value of gold, not the gold bullion price. It's pretty much the same. That's an all time high. Gold's an all time high. I mean, we can infer that maybe that that orange line could come back to trend. Um, but what should you do? Well, OK, uh, my view would be is it comes back to trend by more because, you know, that trend's going up. Uh, if the if the market is uh, you know daft enough to basically undervalue gold near term and you see a cyclical dip, uh, because buyers are exhausted. Well, great, buy more. Uh, that's all I'd say. I mean, it looks to me that that trend is embedded. But I think we need to understand why that trend is going up. Let me just show you a little bit later uh, what's happening to debt dynamics uh, in the US. And we can come back to the challenges for China as well. This is the backdrop for debt worldwide. Now, many people are going to be familiar with this. This is showing how much debt has grown uh, over the period. The reason for singling out uh, China in year 2001, the WTO entry, is that in my view, that was the catalyst that caused uh, the West to start accumulating large amounts of debt, because basically China was a huge challenge. Uh, it undermined the profitability of a lot of Western industry. And what it meant was that debt became the solution uh, for many people's problems. And that debt escalation, I think, began around 2000, early 2000s, as that chart indicates. Now, one of the things about debt, which is what this chart emphasizes, is, and this is what the textbooks and what economists don't tell you, is that debt has to be repaid, right? This is not like an equity where you issue debt, an instrument in perpetuity. You've got to roll the debt. And if you issue a five year bond, you've got to pay, the, in theory at least, pay the debt back uh, in five years' time. Now, spoiler alert debt is never paid back, it's rolled over in aggregate. And so what happens is that over that period, you get as the debt stock 
increases, the size of the rollover of debt becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And if you just look, think of the math, for example, if you've got a $350 trillion debt stock worldwide, which is what we have, and you take an average of a seven-year duration or maturity for that debt, it means you've got to roll over, using simple math, $50 trillion of debt every year. Now, that's a huge ask uh, against the backdrop where global liquidity itself, the stock, is $175 trillion. Uh, the world economy in size is about $120 trillion. So what we're talking about here is a vast amount of money that is required simply to roll over debt. Now, what I've drawn up in this chart, which is the slightly scary, scary thought, is that if you look at this, the red line is what we want to see. This is new capital expenditure, right? This is what corporations spend on plant equipment, you know, building a new chemical works, building a car factory, building, you know, infrastructure, whatever. This is the this is the bedrock of economies and what drives productivity. So that's good. The brown line there is the size of the debt roll each year for the advanced economies worldwide. So in year in 1980, it was about one for one. So capital markets were supplying capital, new capital and rollover capital in equal amounts. By year 2000, you're up to two to one. So in other words, there was twice as much debt roll as new capital. Now we're up to three to one, maybe even challenging four to one. So what, you, what you're saying here is that basically one in, uh, sorry, three in every four transactions in capital markets now are debt refinancing transactions. So capital markets are not the new financing vehicles that textbooks tell you where interest rates matter. Financial markets are now debt refinancing mechanisms where balance sheet capacity matters. And just think of, you know, just think of this in these terms. If the Federal Reserve or if the US Treasury raise interest rates on their debt, right, why should that slow the economy down when so many people own debt and they're receiving what is now a trillion dollars every year as a transfer payment? Surely if interest rates go up, our incomes go up if we're bondholders. And so we spend more. So actually, paradoxically, in this world of excessive debt, rising interest rates are probably a stimulus rather than a, a, a constraint on economies. And this is the way that we've got to start thinking of the world. Now, the last thought about this is this one, is that if you look at the refinancing needs of economies, what this is telling you is that debt and liquidity must move hand in hand. Because if there's lots and lots of debt that needs refinancing, you need liquidity, in other words, balance sheet capacity in the financial system to basically refinance the debt. This is the long term track for advanced economies. There is seems to be a sort of an equilibrium around here, which is about 250, 260 percent or whatever. This is the long term average. But when you start to see the economies moving above that, you tend to see financial crises because that is the problem. Uh, in refinancing. Now, we've adjusted this chart for what's called the maturity wall, which is the bunching of, uh, of debt that needs refinancing. So this is giving you the effective amount pretty much every year. And what you can see is this period from 2015 through basically 2023, 24 was a very benign period. There was lots of liquidity in the system and debt rolled over pretty smoothly. But once you start to move up into this higher area, it becomes trickier. And one of the big problems we've got is something called the maturity wall that you'll have heard about that many Wall Street analysts are describing. And that is because in the era of zero interest rates, a lot of corporations very cleverly thought, let's refinance here uh, at zero interest rates and we can basically extend our debt out uh, into 2026, 2027, et cetera. Now, they were saying that in 2021, or 22 when rates were near zero. But the problem is that they've now got to refinance that debt uh, next year or the year after uh, at much higher rates. And they need balance sheet capacity to do that. And all this debt is kind of coming at once. And that's the problem the world economy faces. Two questions to follow up on. And my mind went to household savings, because when you mentioned like the bond yields and uh, the, the interest payments funneling down into the system, maybe households own some of those bonds. Um, 
the household savings rate, and I've heard an interesting statistic in Germany the other day that the household savings rate is actually pop, uh, coming back up again. Germans are not spending right now. I'm not sure what that looks like in, in, in the US, but it's something that uh, just popped into my head here. Um, so, and the next topic that perfectly fits in that is liquidity crisis, right? So mm-hmm. let's say, let's assume the household starts saving, but uh, my main question is like, do you see a looming liquidity crisis? Because it seems like we need more and more money to refinance what we're seeing. The ratios are expanding. And 2025, 2026, you, you mentioned the maturity wall and the great wall of debt we have to climb, just to quote your article that you put out the other day. Um, is, is, do you foresee a liquidity crisis is, is the big question here. Yeah, I think, there's a, I think there's a risk of that. And let me, let me get back to uh, the, the beginning and the, the, the very first chart I put up, because what it stresses is that what you've got is a cycle, okay? And what that cycle does is it goes up and it goes down now okay we're about midway in that cycle now and i fully envisage uh the next few months will be very benign you're going to get a lot more liquidity coming into markets that black line is going to go up um it may well still peak in late 2025 uh, that's possible you see historically that sometimes those peaks are lower so it might be peaking here rather than up here but it could be it under some pressure and We've got to distinguish the supply of liquidity, which is coming from rising uh, central bank expansions of balance sheets or more liquidity from central banks, and because asset values are going up and collateral is rising, so you're getting banks lending more, from the uses of liquidity. And the uses of liquidity is shown here. So what I've basically said is that, look, these are some of the challenges that you've got for 25. Let's take the US Fed as an example. U.S. Fed liquidity supply may be going up, okay? And I suspect in the next few months it's going to go up quite a lot, right? But then what you've got are a series of demands on that, which are really coming on that right-hand side of the slide. So I've spoken about one of those already, which is debt refinancing needs, which is later in 2025, but certainly in 2026, but markets are going to start to focus on that. The second thing is that I touched on is higher inflation needs, because I think the underlying level of inflation is higher. And if you've got policymakers that are effectively, you know, easing now into a non-recessionary economy where you're looking at a melt up in asset prices, you know for sure that that must be spilling over at some stage into faster high street inflation. Uh, It may not be 2025, but it's likely to be 2026. And that will mean uh, that more liquidity is driving high street inflation, not asset price inflation. And then you've got the top element, which is Chinese demand. Now, this is a very complicated area. And I'm going to say a couple of words about this uh, and try and explain the backdrop. But if you look at what China is is doing and what it's saying, they're kind of two very different things. So what we've been led, led to believe here is there's a massive bazooka which is being fired at Chinese markets uh, to try and you know revive the economy or turn the markets around. Well, let me say that that may be happening, but there's no evidence of it yet. And I know there are sort of various protocol things that the Chinese have to do. They they can announce the package, but until it's approved uh, by uh, the effective effectively the Chinese Parliament, they can't name the amount of the of the of the package. So we don't know whether it's one trillion dollars, two trillion dollars equivalent, or whatever. Uh, but we know they're going to do something. But the one thing that I have said very clearly is that this is not going to be monetized. In other words, that the People's Bank of China's balance sheet is not going to expand. Well, what that really means, uh, in essence, is that they're going to they're going to take or tap existing savings to redeploy in the economy. And that's not really the solution to what China's problems are. What China needs is a big easing of monetary policy because they've got debt deflation. And debt deflation is what crippled the Japanese economy in the 1990s. It's what ultimately hurt uh, the Asian economies like Thailand and the Indonesia in the late 90s. And basically, it's, you know, it, it's a problem that America suffered in the 1930s. And the only way out of that is a looser monetary policy and a much weaker Chinese yuan. Now, if the Chinese start to weaken the yuan, <laughs> I mean, all bets are off on the gold price because the Chinese will gravitate there very, very fast. But ultimately, this is the, the backdrop that we need to think about. In the short term, what you've got, and let me uh, try and pitch in with some evidence here uh, on China, if I can find my chart. Sorry, gone too far. 
This is basically uh, what the Chinese are doing in their money markets in terms of liquidity injections. And this takes us up to the first half of October. In other words, very recent data. Now, what you can see here is that this line, the, the white line, is showing the size of liquidity injections. And here they're adding a lot. Here they're taking some out. Here they're not doing very much. And this is the last three weeks, right? Well, hang on. Does that show there's a bazooka? If there was a bazooka, we would be off the chart. It's actually going down. It's negative. And what's more, if you correlate this chart here in orange with the black line. So let me just be clear what we're showing here. This is PBOC liquidity injections. The black line is what is called a now cast of world GDP growth. So it's basically a, a model which is looking at trying to get daily estimates from lots and lots and lots of inputs as to what the world economy is doing on a daily basis. OK, so this is giving you annualized world GDP growth. And there are things in like credit spreads, like commodity prices, like reports of uh, reported economic data, lots and lots of different things. And what it shows is that the PBOC, the Chinese central bank, leads the world economy in its actions by about three months. So if they inject liquidity, the world economy tends to pick up. If they crash liquidity, the world economy slows down. And this is what they're doing right now. So what they're doing is something very, very different uh, than, <laughs> than what we've been told or been educated. Now, that's a worry. Clearly, the facts can change. Uh, I accept that. But it doesn't look very good in terms of their near-term intentions. So what I would suspect is likely to happen as this plays out is that, number one, uh, the Chinese are basically saying what we want to do is to hold the, the yuan where it is against the US dollar, and we're tightening monetary policy accordingly to, to fulfill that goal. Now, that is a bad policy mix, and it's going to end badly for the Chinese, but it may put a lot more pressure on the ECB and the Federal Reserve to say, well, look, if China's tightening here, uh, we can't afford to have economies slow. We're going to counter that by easing. And maybe that accelerates their easing in the near term. The problem is, is as you start to roll this movie on and you start to look towards the middle of 2025, if the Chinese and the world economies genuinely are slowing down, then there may be a great need for greater dollar, dollar liquidity in corporations worldwide as a protection if the world economy slows. And make no mistake, China is a dollarized economy, okay? Uh, Chinese banks have got big balance sheet exposure gr in gross terms uh, to the US dollar, and Chinese corporations, uh, in terms of their export markets, trade in dollars. Uh, they may not, you know, they don't repatriate their dollars, they keep them offshore, but they're basically are very dollar hungry. And if the PBOC is squeezing sufficiently, they may go out into dollar markets and try and borrow more dollars, which will then create more of a shortage worldwide. So what I'm trying to say is that mm. now it looks great, okay, uh, in terms of what the situation is. We're at all-time high for risk assets. Next year, you've got challenges. You've got three things that are coming up. What is the ultimate solution for those three things? It's more liquidity because that's the, you know, kicking the can down the road is what our politicians know best. So we've got to be cognizant of the cycle, but we also got to be aware that there's a whopping great trend here. And that trend means you've got to own gold. Um, the cycle means let's try and trade this as best we can. And OK, let's, you know, as they say, you know, enjoy the party, but dance near the door. Um, so um, keep a, you know, keep an eye on risk. It was, it was supposed to be my last question here as well. Like, A, I'm going to steal from your script here, but what can policymakers do to protect investors? And B, what should we as investors do to protect ourselves? Because we can't really trust the policymakers, quite honestly, to well, protect Well, let, let's us, answer, so. the, the, answer the second one first, because that's, <laughs> that's the easiest one, Guy. What we do is we basically get rid of the 60-40 um, asset allocation model that everyone had been educated on in the last two or three decades. 60% equities, 40% bonds. Equities are probably not too bad, particularly if you're going for uh, blue chip equities of corporations that have got control over their profit margins and they can basically raise prices. So that's, you know, these blue chip companies look great, I would think, on a medium term view. 
doesn't mean to say their prices, their share prices won't go down if there's a sell-off. They will, but then it gives an opportunity to buy more uh, <laughs> of what are probably good companies. So, you know, the world is not going out of business. These things are still going to be producing. Do you want to own government bonds where the government is dedicated to increasing uh, the amount of debt in the system by around 8 to 10% per annum? And I would think the answer to that is probably not. I certainly wouldn't want to be caught in that, particularly if, you, if you're buying longer dated debt. OK, pension funds have to, banks have to, uh, but the average individual doesn't have to do that. So I would avoid that. And what I would do is to think about that 40% that you've allocated to bonds in the past and start to parcel up by dedicated monetary inflation hedges, which means gold and, if you're inclined that way, Bitcoin. The second thing to do is to try, buy treasury inflation-protected securities, so index-linked bonds. Now, there are not that many available in Europe, uh, in the Eurozone. There's, there, there are French index linked as I know. Um, but the UK has uh, uh, index of gilt, but the US Treasury uh, tips are, uh, I think, a fantastic value right now. So I'd be buying that bid. I'd be putting more money into cash because uh, I think that markets may, you know, I'm not going to say they're going to hit a wall, but they're, they're getting closer uh, to the end. I mean, we've got to remember here that, you know, we've had a bull market for two years now. Uh, many, many people have been, uh, have refused to believe that. There's been a lot of pessimism, but then after all, markets always climb a wall of worry. So that's no great surprise. But the reality is that after two years of a, of a bull market, uh, you have typically on average have seen 80% of the ultimate gains. So we've got to be cognizant of risk in that respect. There's still more to go, I think. But, you know, uh, as I said before, I mean, enjoy the party, but just dance near the door in case there's a problem. Uh, and uh, what I'd also be thinking about is prime residential real estate, because, you know, that's a decent long term inflation hedge. So I think that 40 percent could be sliced up in a different way, have a bit of gold, have a bit of Bitcoin, uh, have residential real estate as, a, as an investment, uh, have um, uh, treasure inflation protected securities. But keep an eye that 40 percent has got to be focused on monetary inflation hedges in my view. Phenomenal. Michael, what a wonderful conversation. And uh, I've taken a ton of notes and I'll definitely have to rewatch parts of it. But uh, I think you explained it perfectly and uh, really, really appreciate your time. Where, where can we follow more of your work? Like, how, how do we get more of your knowledge? Well, the, uh, the easiest way is Capital Wars is a Substack publication that we frequently uh, write uh, two or three uh, articles a week on what's happening on global liquidity, what's our narrative, how we see things. Uh, there's an institutional investor service as well, uh, which is available at uh, crossbordercapital.com, where we provide a lot more uh, uh, analysis and data, uh, particularly if you're a quant fund. Uh, and then we have a Twitter handle, which is at crossbordercap for the occasional tweet. So those are the sources. And if, you, if you're inclined to read books, I wrote a book called Capital Wars uh, about five years ago, the same title as the Substack, uh, outlining this global liquidity phenomenon. Michael, I forgot to ask you one question. I'm going to do it now because everybody switched off now. Nobody's going to listen to it, but uh, I'm going to ask it anyway because I'm curious what your answer to it is. But will the Fed start buying bonds? Will they have to start buying bonds at some point? Yeah, unquestionably. Oh. There's, there's, there's no way they, they won't uh, because the Federal Reserve balance sheet has to expand. And the only route they've got to do that is to buy government securities. So they're, they're, I mean, even if you look at the, the estimates, the official estimates that come out of the Congressional Budget Office, which is a bipartisan body in the US, they have US Treasury bond holdings going up, Fed holdings of Treasury bonds going up, uh, you know, in a straight line, uh, maybe after this year. So it, it's there. I mean, they're going to end QT. They've de facto ended it anyway, but they're going to end it pretty soon, formally. Yeah, it's another aspect of debt monetization you mentioned earlier. Yeah. So, but I, for, I forgot to throw that in there earlier. So, no, Michael, really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for making the time. It's, I know it's Friday, so enjoy your weekend. And, uh, can't wait to catch up with you again soon. So we'll, we'll, make, we'll have to do this again. Thank you so much for your time and to everybody else. Thank you so much for tuning in here to Soar Financially. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Michael Howell. I sure did. And I'm definitely going to rewatch that 10 minute part that I mentioned in earlier. And uh, there's so much in there because it really connects all the dots in the global financial markets. And uh, a lot of the things we discuss here on the channel are 
being connected here. So if you just watch 10 minutes of this interview, make sure it's that. I'll see if I can highlight it properly um, in the in the conversation. But that is really, really valuable. And I think that's every, something everybody should watch to understand what is happening in the world right now. If you haven't done so, please hit that subscribe button. It helps us out tremendously, reach a wider audience, educate other investors, and uh, just inform you what is going on. So really appreciate that. And uh, I'll see you in Frankfurt, Deutsche Goldmesse, November 21st and 22nd. Make sure to come out. Make sure to sign up. It's free for investors to attend. We have some great keynote speakers attending. It's not Michael, sadly, this time. We've had him on before. We'll definitely try to get him back in May. Michael, we'll have to talk about that at some point. And uh, really looking forward to seeing everybody in Frankfurt if you can make the trip. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back with lots more here on SOAR Financially.